Good evening. Excited about uh, being here tonight. I hope you are as well. It's part two of our survey through the books of the Bible. And um, it's, it's challenging to, to look at the books and see where they belong in the scripture and why they're there and these kinds of things. And it's always good to revisit these and then uh, try to present um, a short lesson based uh, from the text there. That was my second choice as Moses in chapter 3 is standing on holy ground. That was my second choice. Uh, I picked something a little more obscure, maybe something that you may not spend time um, looking at uh, as you go through the scriptures. But I think when we get there, I think you're going to see why I chose it. Um, I'm just thankful to be here. I'm thankful um, for the Invite Your Friend Day that we have, Invite Your Neighbor Day that's coming up here in a couple of weeks. Uh, John asked me to preach a very encouraging uh, lesson on where the worm never dies and the fire's never quenched. So I, I plan to do that. No. Um, we're, going to, we're going to stick with our theme, uh, but it's going to be different than what we've been talking about thus far. So um, I'm, I'm excited about that and excited to, to meet your friends or family or neighbors uh, who will be coming. And um, hopefully it will be very encouraging for them as it will for us. Uh, would you pray with me as, as we begin, please? Thank you, Father, so much for the many ways that you love us and the many ways that you've shown us that you love us. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to sing and the opportunity to pray, for the opportunity to share our lives with each other and to, to join our hearts and minds in worship to you. Thank you for your Son for the amazing gift, that indescribable gift that Jesus gave us, that you gave us. Help us tonight, Father, as we look into another portion of your word to be uh, encouraged by it, to be reminded of just how much you love us, and to be also reminded, Father, of our responsibility to you. Help us, Father, to grow day by day, to become more like your Son. It's through Jesus we pray. Amen. Tonight, we're going to look, once again, in the Old Testament, we're just coming all the way through. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 tells us that whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and the comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. And, of course, when... Paul is writing to the Roman Christians in Romans chapter 15. The things written before refer back to the old law, the Old Testament as we call it today. And so there are many, many things that we can continue to learn from the Old Testament. I've heard uh, people, even members of the church, say we don't need the Old Testament anymore. Shame on them. It's God's Word. It's God's Word even if there are major portions of it that don't apply to us in a um, literal sense today, we can still learn from those things how to be pleasing to God. We can learn a lot about who God is, but there's still also a lot of great teaching for us in the Christian age coming out of the Old Testament. And so it, it's important to go and revisit these things and to get a nice blend of the whole counsel of God. You know, there's a lot of the New Testament you can't understand if you don't have your Old Testament. <laughs> Many things. There are a lot of scriptures quoted from the Old Testament in the New Testament, and if, it, if we didn't need the Old Testament anymore, then why did the New Testament writers put it there? You see, we need the Old Testament. The book of Exodus is one of those books that Christians ought to be going back to time and time again. There is so much pre-Christianity Christianity found in the book of Exodus. There are the types and the shadows that I've talked about of the, the things that, that are precursors. They're pointing us to what is going to happen when Jesus comes pointing us to what is going to happen when his church is present, his kingdom is present on the earth, and Exodus is no exception to that. There is much we can learn, 
and much uh, which can help us. And so tonight we want to look at the book of Exodus and um, we're going to, as we did last week and we'll continue to do, we're going to do an overview of the book before we get to our lesson uh, just to help us to figure out where we are. This is probably going to be uh, remedial for some of you and a reminder, but for others there may be some things here that you, that you may learn and may be beneficial for you as we look through the book. The word Exodus, once again, the Old Testament titles are taken from the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Um, the word Exodus from the Greek means an exit or a departure or departing. And so the book takes its name uh, quite uh, honestly from the exit out of Egypt. That is, the, and, and there's so much more in the book besides that, but that's where it takes its name. Uh, Moses is its author. Um, Jesus attests to the Mosaic authorship of uh, the book of Exodus. Uh, there are those who would challenge that, but their, their challenges fall on deaf ears for anyone that spends any time reading through the scriptures uh, because their challenge is to what Jesus said. You know, I'm, I, I'm big on what Jesus says. And, and I hope you are too, and if you're not, I hope you're bigger on what Jesus says after you listen to me preach a few times. Because if Jesus says it, and you don't believe it, you're either saying he's a liar or you don't care. I mean, that's, that's just pretty much what it is. And if Jesus says, have you not read where Moses said, and he quotes something from a particular book, and it's not a quote directly from what Moses said, you know, the first five books of the Bible, what we call the Torah or the Pentateuch today, were referred to in Jesus' time as the book of Moses. And you would refer to Moses. You wouldn't refer to Genesis or Leviticus. You'd refer to Moses. And so when he says, when Moses says, he's talking about the books of Moses, and they got their name, the books of Moses, from the fact that he's the one that penned them. And with the exception of the end of Deuteronomy and the death of Moses, he's responsible for all of it. It's believed, and we'll talk about this uh, when we talk about Deuteronomy, um, Joshua took over and wrote the close to Deuteronomy and recorded the death of uh, and burial of Moses for us. So we need to trust Jesus. When Jesus says it's this, we don't need going to go looking for another explanation. We need to expend our energy doing something else, productive instead of fighting against Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. It was written after the departure from Sinai um, because a lot of the events uh, leading up to Sinai, the giving of the law and the golden calf and those things couldn't have been written before uh, by Moses uh, in, in the eyewitness account that he gives us of those things so it's important to understand you know with Genesis we weren't sure where it's written it could have been written in Egypt it could have been written um, when he was in Midian in the wilderness and it could have been written after they left Egypt we just don't know because there's nothing in the scripture that gives us any indication as to the time it was written Exodus 1 it begins by telling us about the death of Joseph and his brothers uh, and very quickly, we're introduced to a king who did not know Joseph. A king who did not know Joseph. And that brought about some hardships for God's people. Because God's people, the family of Abraham that went down out of the land of Canaan to Egypt, was respected by the royalty of Egypt because Joseph had saved the country. They loved Joseph. Joseph was in charge of everything except Pharaoh himself. He was well thought of. God had prepared Joseph all of those years. And now a king arises that didn't know Joseph. It's believed by many scholars that there was a change in the dynasty there and the lineage of the leaders changed. There was a political upheaval and a new dynasty arose. And as a result, they sought to change everything. Kind of like what we do every four years in Washington. Um, but maybe to a much more brutal extent. And so with the change of the leadership, we see an enslavement of the Hebrew people. 
They made them slaves because they outnumbered them. In chapter 2, we see the birth of Moses. This, this is very important for us to understand. The birth of Moses was, was critical in so many ways in how things were handled and how God's providence played in to the saving of Moses. Remember, what were they supposed to do with the, the Hebrew baby boys? Supposed to kill them. And his mother did not kill him. You remember what she put him in? A basket. Some versions of the Bible call it what? An ark. It was an ark. See, it was something made to float. It wasn't made to go anywhere. That's what the ark was that Noah was in. It had nowhere to go. And when you see all these artist depictions, you know, with, with, with starboard and bow and, you know, holes that are shaped, it was a big rectangular box because it wasn't going anywhere. It was made to float and to hold a large quantity of goods. It didn't have anywhere to go. There was no guidance system on it. There was no rudder. Why? Where was it going to go? Go find some more water? The whole earth was flooded. There was nowhere to go. He was float, and then God set it down when he was ready to set it down. So there's this ark, this little basket that has been waterproofed, and then it is presented to Pharaoh's daughter. And, of course, Moses' mother becomes the handmaiden to take care of. And God providentially took care of all of that so that he was raised not only with the knowledge of the house of Pharaoh, but also the knowledge of God from his people. Moses became angry. Anybody ever get mad? Three of you. If I'm here much longer, that'll change. But we do. I mean, sometimes our anger, but it's, uh, probably most of us, if not all of us, have never killed somebody because we got so mad. We might have thought about it, but we didn't do it. Well, Moses got mad enough to kill somebody, and he had to flee. Had to leave because his life was in danger. So he goes to Midian, and he is about 40 years old when he commits this murder. And so he flees to Midian. He starts a new life. And he spends about 40 years in Midian. And then in chapter 2, what Gene was referring to when he was leading the songs, Holy, 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 and Holy Ground. Uh, and again, my second choice of lessons to bring, because there's so much we can learn from the burning bush passage. And Jesus makes reference, direct reference to it. Um, He sees a bush that's not consumed by fire. And he's curious. And he draws near. And he hears a voice. And he's told to remove his sandals because the ground on which he stands is holy. It's a fascinating passage. God commissions Moses, but not without resistance. And it wasn't his sheep, and it wasn't his family. It was Moses himself. Moses had every excuse in the book for God as to why he couldn't do what God told him to do. And for every excuse, God presented him with a solution. Till finally, Moses just had to give up and do what God told him to do. So in chapter 4 and verse 18, Moses returns to Egypt. He's 80 years old. He's been gone for 40 years. And in chapters 5 through 7, we see his beginning encounters with Pharaoh. And those didn't go very well. And I don't know how much effort was put into it by Moses and Aaron. I don't know how much Pharaoh was satisfied with all the free labor he was getting and didn't want to give up his free labor. But God providentially was working through this entire situation towards a meaningful end. 
as a child, you see it, and that first plague comes, and he says he's going to let his people go, and then he decides not to. And it's like, oh, we were so close. But God had a bigger plan than for them to just go away after the first plague. And we'll see that when we get a little further along. Aaron serves as the spokesperson because one of Moses' excuses before God in the burning bush was, well, I just don't talk very well. Now, if God comes to you in a burning bush and tells you to go tell somebody something, is that the first thing he's going to hear? You know, I just don't talk very well, God. And, you know, I mean, it's a burning bush and it's not consumed. But, you know, we, we, we think about this and it's like, I don't know that that'd be the first thing I would say. I don't know what I would say. But, you know, we have the benefit of hindsight looking back at what he said and we probably wouldn't want to say what he said. But that's, that's what Moses came up with, what Aaron was chosen as the spokesperson. We see in chapters 7 through 12, the ten plagues. And as these plagues come through, each of these plagues, uh, as we have studied archaeology and history, we come to find out that each of these plagues was an attack on the false gods of Egypt. The water was turned to blood. The Nile River was a god to the Egyptian people. God was showing his power over the gods of Egypt. Frogs? There, there, is, there are actually little statues and jewelry that are found, were found in the pyramids of frogs. They worshiped them. And what do you do when you're covered six inches deep in your gods? Well, you don't kill them right? So you just stuck with frogs. Lice or gnats, depending on how that word is translated. Flies. You know what? There's one thing that will absolutely drive me insane, and that's a fly in the house. And, and I will go around until I kill the fly that's in my house. Now, Susie can attest to this. I can usually swat them out of the air with my hand. But as I've gotten older, it takes me a couple of more swats to get to them than it used to. I used to catch them in my hand out of the air. Not quite that fast anymore. Livestock was diseased. Now, can you imagine uh, today that there are people starving to death in countries like India because they won't kill a cow because they think that's Uncle Bob? And we kind of think that's silly, but they're not the first people to believe that. To the Egyptians, they were, the livestock were gods to them. It was disease. Boils came upon their skin. You know, they themselves were thought to be gods. Hail came, destroyed crops. The locusts came. How many of you have ever seen a swarm of locusts? Impressive. Highly impressive insects can render live vegetation to nothing in no time flat. It, it, it's like this nebulous thing, and then when it lands, it doesn't leave anything. <laughs> Locust. And then darkness. The, the chief god was Ra, the sun god. And when God covered the sun, their, their God was gone. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to back up and tell you a little something. That since the very beginning, the prophets foretold of Christ coming. Abel was the first prophet. And Abel, we're not told in the Old Testament all the things that he prophesied. But when we get to the New Testament, there are things that we're given some insight into about his prophecies. But we also see that Christ coming was foretold from the foundation of the world. And we see there in Genesis 3.15, and we think, well, that's what it's talking about. The prophets that came from God were talking about God's Son coming. And they told about His death and His resurrection. And today, the eggheads of society that don't believe in God will say, oh, well, Christianity borrowed it from these old myths. 
from the Egyptian myths, from the Babylonian myths. Folks, the Babylonian myths and the Egyptian myths were based in the fact of the prophecies of God's people going back to the beginning of time. That's where it came from. And they just changed it. Do you know the sun god Ra for the Egyptians was resurrected every morning and died every night? Where do you think they got that idea? It, co it goes all the way back to the early prophets before there was even writing taking place. There were the prophecies that were, were going forth. And so in the middle of, of all of this, and we get down past the ninth, we see the Passover being instituted. And the Passover was this meal. Uh, it was preemptive in its focus to prepare God's people for something that was going to happen. And in the 28 verses that open up chapter 12, we see God regulating what the people were going to do. And they were going to take a male lamb or goat, unblemished, no broken bones, and they were going to take its blood and they were going to paint it on the, the lintel and the doorposts. Okay, have we seen anything like that other places in the scripture? A lamb, unblemished male? Folks, that's talking about Jesus Christ. That's what the Passover was all about. Yes, it served a secondary purpose, but its ultimate purpose was pointing us to Christ. It was pointing God's people to Christ and telling us long before he came, you've got to do this. And so the, the Lord would pass over and the destroyer would, would not enter into and destroy the firstborn of the houses where they were covered by the blood of the Lamb. Covered by the blood of the Lamb. That's the second book of the Old Testament. That's not Luke. That's not Acts. That's Exodus. And we don't need our Old Testaments? Hmm. God, was, God had this all worked out from the beginning, but what is he doing? He's, he's teaching his people this and getting them ready because every year they're going to remember the Passover all of these years until... The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world is sacrificed during the Passover. Is that accidental? Oh, that's intentional. That's not symbolic. That's fulfillment. It's beautiful. Verse 12 is a, is a critical part of this text. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night... I will strike all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. I tell you, when you read through Exodus and you see something ended with I am the Lord, you better go back and read it again. God's pretty serious. He's putting his stamp on it. And it all comes back to his holiness. What Gene was pointing us to with the songs. It's all about his holiness. <clears throat> but he was going to set apart his people. And this is how he was going to do it. He was going to free them. And so the tenth of the ten plagues comes in. It's the death of the firstborn. From the royal palace all the way to the dungeons. Not one house was spared except for those that were covered by the blood of the Lamb. Those were the only houses spared. I'm going to tell you, there's a day coming when he's going to pass through the land at his return and all the graves are going to open up and he's going to be in the air and as he is passing through this world, however that's going to happen and all eyes see him, The only ones who are going to go with him are those that are covered by the blood of the Lamb. It's the only ones.
They get to go. And that's what he's trying to tell us here. He's trying to wake us up. Because, you know, our, our sin is our bondage. Just like theirs was physical bondage in Egypt. They had a cruel taskmaster in the, in the Pharaoh. We've got a cruel taskmaster in Satan. You know, we've got to come out of that bondage. He delivers us out of that bondage because we're covered by the blood. And so we see the exodus taking place in chapter 13. There towards the end of chapter 12, we see that they are released. The exodus takes place, and we are told in chapter 13, in verse 18, God led the people. That's four words right there. Four words you're going to want to underline in your Bible. God led the people. That hadn't changed. That has not changed. And when God's people today are successful in doing what God has said, guess who our, our leader is? God is. Oh, yeah, we have earthly leaders that, that take certain positions like me or the elders or somebody else, but it's not our doing, it's God. If it becomes about me or the elders or some other leader in the church, and it, then why do we need God? We see the Red Sea crossing. Folks, this is an amazing event. 600,000 men plus women and children. If you figure a man and a woman, or a man and a, a woman and a child, Throwing a, a woman and a child for every man that's over the age of 20, fighting age. You're probably going to come short, but it'll give you a better idea of what you're dealing with here. Cecil B. DeMille did the very best he could in creating that little hallway through the Red Sea. And people walking one behind the other through the Red Sea. Folks, you're not going to get two million people through there like that. Not in one night, you're not. Not in two nights, you're not. Folks, the, the miracle, and, and it would have been a miracle to create that trench for people to walk through. That, that, that would have been a, But folks, the miracle is in one night, two million people plus animals, carts, and everything else cross the Red Sea on dry ground. That's the miracle. This thing was wide. Why do you think the Egyptians had no problem rushing in after them? It wasn't a tunnel. You know, if I saw a tunnel like that with water standing up on the side, I'd have to go, now wait just a minute. It'd only take just a little bit, and that falls, and I'm dead, right? You get crushed by the water. This thing was huge. This, it had to be wide for these people to cross. And for the Egyptians to have all that confidence, just go charging in after them. And they go charging in and after them, and all of a sudden, the water returns. I had a cousin who was raised in the church and became an atheist. And he was telling me just how silly the Bible was and the things the Bible, you know, well, they're, they're just children's stories and they're myths and they're fables and they're all of this. And, and that Red Sea crossing thing, you know, there was just this big sandbar and the wind was blowing and it just, you know, the water was about a foot deep and it blew the water off and they just walked across on a sandbar. And I said, that's an even bigger miracle. He says, why? I said, because God drowned the Egyptian army in a foot of water. He wasn't happy with that. But, I mean, you think about it. How do you drown an army? I mean, I know you can drown in this much water, but an entire army and their animals? No, that's not going to happen in that much water. That water was deep. They were crushed by the water. And so when we get to the other side, they're hungry. God feeds them with manna. The, the literal meaning of the word manna means what is it? That's what it means. What is it? it? It was nutritious little pieces of bread or something. We don't know exactly what it was, but I tell you, if we could find the ark, if 
Indiana Jones could tell us which warehouse they put it in. We could go inside of it, and we could find the bowl of manna that was inside the ark. Now, we don't know where the ark is. We don't have any idea. But you know what was inside of it, right? Aaron's staff that budded, the Ten Commandments on the tablets, and a bowl of manna. That's what was inside of it. Wow, wouldn't that be great to see that? But more blessed is he that having not seen and yet believes. That's what Jesus said. God provides them water from a rock or a ran, one of the two. He knew I was going to say that, and he's the only one that got it. <laughs> from a rock or I ran, yeah. Uh, but from a rock, I mean, just water just comes forth, and it's water enough for two million people and their animals. It's not the water fountain out here. You th I mean, s wrap your head around it. Two million people. How hard is it to get two million people in this area fresh water every day for showers? It requires a, a vast system to provide that water. And God does it from a rock. You know, we're not talking about 20 people standing there and there's this little trickle of water. and We can all wait our turn. They're thirsty. They need water to survive. And so in chapter 19, they show up at Mount Sinai. Moses is called up on the mountain. Chapter 20, we see the Ten Commandments being given to Moses. 21 through 31, it's the giving of the, the various laws. You know, we oftentimes think about Moses going up there, and he got the, uh, the Ten Commandments, and he came back down. He was there a long time. If you, if you read why the people sinned, it's because we don't know what has happened to this man, Moses. He's been gone too long. We need somebody else to take over for him. He was gone a long time. And so they come to Aaron, they bring their gold, and Aaron forms for them a golden calf. And he says, Behold your God that brought you up out of Egyptian bondage. And they rose up and began to worship and to engage in debauchery and all kinds of things. Well, when Moses came down, there was a need for a new set of tablets. He was pretty mad. And so he breaks the tablets. And he goes back up. He, his anger, that anger that caused him to kill the Egyptian, he probably felt like slaying a few of his own brethren at that point. But he didn't. 35 through 40, we see the making of the tabernacle according to the, the plan that God had given them. Um, we see the, the Ark of the Covenant and the instruments of sacrifice and all of these things are being brought together and put together in an amazing way in the middle of nowhere. One of the key verses of Exodus, Exodus chapter 40 and verse 38 for the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, and the fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all of their journeys. The presence of God was there day or night. Going back to chapter 13, verse 18, God led his people. Very, very beautiful thing. Exodus is so rich. There's so much to learn there. But I'd like for us to go to chapter 21 for just a couple of moments. Chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. And among the various laws that were given by God to Moses concerning uh, things of import, now these are the judgments which you shall set before them. <clears throat> if you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years. In the seventh, he shall go out free and pay nothing. If he comes in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master has given him a wife and she has borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters and he shall go out by himself. But if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go out free. Then the master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door 
or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. This is fascinating. And it gives us some insight into slavery during that time. Um, there, there are far too many people who want to criticize the Bible because it permits slavery and acknowledges it. Th- this is not 1850 in Louisiana. Most of this was economic-based. It had nothing to do with oppression. It had to do with you're in debt. You've got to get out of debt. The only way you can work your way out of debt is to uh, join yourself to a person or put yourself up and somebody purchases you. That's how it worked. And after six years of your working, the seventh year, guess what you got to do? You walked away. You're free. If you brought a wife in, you take your wife out. If you brought children in, you take your children out. But if your master provides you a wife and you have children, they still belong to the master. But there's a choice that the servant gets to make. If the servant loves his master, he can choose to stay. And if he stays, he never leaves. That's powerful. Now again, this is pointing us to something much bigger, much more important. And we'll look at that in just a moment. But the process of this is you go to to your master and you tell him and the master goes to the judges and the judges have to approve it. It's not something that, you know, with a bullwhip you force him into doing something. This is all voluntary by your own volition you choose to indenture yourself for the rest of your life to a person that's where that's where i want to stay and so the sign of that is they would go to the doorpost and they would take your earlobe and they would take an awl and they would pierce your ear into the doorpost and that was the sign that you would serve them for the rest of your life. Do you know the song? Pierce My Ear? Can you bring that song up for us, Mark? Here. Yeah, after this slide. How many of you know the song, Pierce My Ear? A handful of you. Beautiful, beautiful song. And it's based on this text. That's what it's from. What does it have to do with us as Christians? Well, let's take a look in 1 Corinthians. Chapter 7. Twenty-two and twenty-three. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians seven, twenty-two and twenty-three. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's free man. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. And as you look through this entire section, it's, it, it's basically about... D- Work where you're planted. Do what it is that God has called you to do. You're a Christian now. Don't go making all of these serious changes. Just live your life. Be a Christian. Belong to the Lord. If you're a slave, stay a slave. The letter to uh, Philemon, you don't have it? Wow. Did you look under the contemporary extra songs that are on there it's not it's not under there either wow okay and i don't think it's in our book is it okay um i've I've got it on my computer um but the if you were if you're a slave you're now free in christ even though you're a slave the the letter to fine leman is about uh, a runaway slave who became a christian 
And Paul is telling him, okay, you fulfill your duty and you go back to your master. But he's also writing to the master who's also a brother in Christ and tell him to receive him as a brother in Christ. Because legally there were things that he could do that would not be pleasant for Onesimus when he returned to Philemon. Romans chapter 6, 16 through 18 probably gives us the most important view of, of what Exodus is leading us up to. Beginning in verse 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, that you are that one's slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. We are told in the New Testament that you're always going to be a slave. You're always going to be a slave. You're either going to be a slave to sin, to this world, to your, your own desires, or you're going to be a slave to righteousness, a slave of Christ, a bondservant. There's, there's no neutral ground. You can't just go hang out in the middle somewhere. It doesn't work that way. When you've been set free from sin, now you're Christ's slave. Before you're set free from sin, you're a slave to sin. You're captured by it. When we come out of that slavery and we're set free, symbolically what we're doing is we're going to our new master. And we're saying, I'm going to be with you. Take me to your door and pierce my ear. That's what we're doing. And we don't wear the physical symbol of a pierced ear as the sign of our, our slavery to Christ. But spiritually, that's what we have. That's what we have done. I will serve you forever. That's what, we, that's what we're saying when we commit our lives to Christ. I will serve you forever. I would, I would much rather be your slave that continue in slavery to my desires, to my wants, to my addictions, to the world, to Satan, to sin. I would much rather be your slave. Jesus tells us, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Compared to the burden of sin in our lives, it is so much lighter. The hardships as they were seen by God's people in the wilderness were nothing compared to the hardships that they faced in Egypt. But they soon forgot their hardship and they, they wanted to return. They kept wanting to return. And it's unfortunate, but it's true that there are some people who become Christians that they haven't counted the cost and they want to go back to their former life. And they do. But we've made a commitment. And our commitment is to him. He's our master. You know, when we say Lord, there's two ways that the word Lord is used in the New Testament, the word kurios in the original. It's either meant master as like a schoolmaster or that type of a master, or it means sir. And so there's a couple of times you see Jesus addressed as sir, like by Saul on the road to Damascus. He didn't know him as Lord and master. He's saying, sir, who are you that I've persecuted you? He's saying, sir. So the context determines. But folks, when we're Christians, he's not sir. He's master. He's Lord. He is our all in all. He has everything that we need. And there's nothing that we need that he doesn't have. He takes such good care of us. And the care that he provides us here is nothing compared to the care that he has waiting for us 
John chapter 14, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. There is a prepared place that awaits us. And what a joy that's going to be. We're about to sing a song. I'm sorry we can't sing that other song, but I will find it and I will make sure that we get an opportunity to sing it. It it is so beautiful. And once you've heard it once, you'll want to sing it a thousand times. It is gorgeous. The sentiment is fantastic. But Gene's picked a song out for us. And if you're here tonight, if you're struggling with something, if you need prayers, if you need our encouragement, or if you're here tonight and you never obeyed the gospel and you'd like to put on Christ in baptism, believing in him as the Son of God, confessing his precious name, repenting of your sins, and being immersed in water for the remission of those sins, raised to walk in a new life, we stand ready to assist you tonight. Whatever your need is, won't you please come as together we stand and sing.